Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Marine Corps Brigadier General George Bartlett. He is a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. In all, he spent 36 years in the Marine Corps. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, where were you born and raised, sir? Born in Nampa, Idaho, and raised in Idaho. My father at first worked for the Union Pacific Railroad, but uh, then in the, during the Depression, they fired him or let him off. And he got a job with the state of Idaho, building roads in Custer County, Idaho, up near Sun Valley. And we lived in a little town called Mackey. Population 777. Never, never varied because every time my baby was born, somebody left town. And uh, it's supposed to be a joke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I did, didn't get any laugh, so I. Uh, <laughs> but it was a small town and near the craters of the moon. And my father was the engineer that built the road through the craters of the moon that exists today, U.S. Highway 20. The craters of the moon is a piece of piece of the moon that sits near Arco, Idaho, in the center center part of Idaho. Quite a place to visit. What when did you join the service? 15 February 1943. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in Portland, Oregon. Left that night for San Diego to recruit depot. Should I just go through and kind of tell you what went to what I did? Uh, sure, just go through your training. And we went to Marine Corps recruit depot in San Diego, which was then 12 or 13 weeks long, and um, rifle range included, highest highest shooter on the rifle range of my group, and uh, that's always a, a kudo. And they, they give you tests when you get there, a GCT, general classification test, and pattern analysis test, and blah, blah. But I was uh, told after, after boot camp, 12 weeks, 13 weeks boot camp, that I was going to go be a navigator. And I was 18 years old, and they called me in the next day and said, well, you've got to be 19 to go to navigation school, so you can't go. What school would you like to go to? Well, all my buddies in my recruit training had gone to Chicago to uh, Navy Pier to school. And I looked up on the board and they were leaving the next week for Navy Pier. The detachments left on Thursday and it was Wednesday. And I'm talking to this gentleman and I said, well, I'll go. And I looked up, glanced up, AMM school. And he said, uh, go pack your bag. You're leaving tomorrow morning for Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> So instead of going to be in Chicago, Illinois, where the liberty is good, I got sent to Jacksonville, Florida, and I um, on a troop train out of San Diego. I went all over, and we ended up in Jacksonville. 26 weeks of school of AMM, aviation machinist mate, learning to be an aircraft mechanic. Great school, and um, I was kind of a half-assed mechanic anyway. My father worked on cars and worked on his car, and I helped him. So I really enjoyed it. And I graduated number one in the class. They took me before an old uh, colonel in the Marine Corps uh, who was, uh, fought in Nicaragua, flew in Nicaragua. I had his name, but I've forgotten it now. And he said, what do you want to do in the Marine Corps, Corporal? I said, I'm a private, sir. He said, no, you're a corporal. I just promoted you. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an NAP, Naval Aviation Pilot enlisted pilot. He said, great. He said, I'm going to send you. It's going to take 18 months, so uh, I'm going to send you to navigation school first, and you'll go to Quantico, Virginia, and go to Navigator Bombardier School. And that'll be 16 weeks or so, and then uh, after that you can join the squadron, go fly your missions in, in the Far East, come back, 18 months will be up, and then you can go to flight school. So that's really was what a was going to happen to me, and I, when the war, when the war ended, I was headed home to go to flight school, and uh, was on an island in the Admiralty Islands, Los Negros, and then Manus, and a uh, ship finally came by and picked us up. We waited 91 days for a ship. The war had just ended, and there was a lot of confusion. Well, let's but back I, up just a moment, yeah. uh, not skip over the part where you served in the Pacific uh, as as a bombardier. Uh, talk about that. Well, I flew uh, flew 75 missions. Our, we, the plane we flew was a, was 
the Navy version of the B-25, the new little plane, called, called a PBJ, patrol bomber by a North American. And I, I, was, I was the nose gunner, the bombardier, and the navigator. We, we were bombing Kaviang, New Ireland, and Rabaul on New Britain, where there were 400,000 Japs. And uh, once they were cut off and couldn't be resupplied, we bombed them on a continuous basis uh, every day and every night. So you had sometimes you had night Heckler missions where two planes went out. One plane circled at 12,000 feet. They put the lights on you and you could read the book up there, read a book up there, or while well, the guy down below was <laughs> shooting the searchlights. And then when, when you dropped all your bombs, you'd trade places and they would, they would be up at 13,000 feet. And you looked for the searchlight so you could shoot them out. And we did that a couple of times. Mostly it was day, day, day flights to Kaviang or Rabaul. Some high level, eight, 10,000. Uh, some low level. Uh, and we all always enjoyed the low level because you got to shoot the nose gun. Uh, one flight we were making a a recce down New Ireland, which is a couple hundred miles long, and the road just goes right down the coast. So we had a 2,000 pound bomb with a 12 second delay fuse, and which means when you drop it, it stops and then you move on 12 seconds, and then it explodes. So I got up on top of the bomb bay and took out the hatch and watched the bomb drop. We were maybe 200, 300 feet. And this 2,000 pound bomb, which is a big piece of iron, believe me. It was knocking down palm trees, and I'm counting 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, knocking down these trees, but it's directly below. I'm looking right at it. I can almost read the, read the numbers on it. And uh, then it started slowing down a little bit at about 8 or 9, 10, 11, and it's now, I can't see it anymore, 12. Then I saw the flash. but. We were well out of it, so it was no problem. But I'm saying to myself, next time don't get up here and look. You know, this uh, you might be too much too surprised. But I said to myself, that's what the tail gunner sees. Sees the same thing I'm looking at right now, and, he, and it doesn't bother him. Why should it bother you that that bomb is going to explode? So uh, it was one just another mission. But uh, we've, we never went up for any shipping because there was none, none left. Uh, we were, well, we went up to Palawat, 550 miles away. Uh, a squadron, we had four squadrons in the group. Each squadron gave two ships. They had to get eight, and then the leader was the ninth, ninth plane. They put um, upper bomb bay tanks in, 215-gallon upper bomb, upper bomb bay tanks, to go along with the 974-gallon wing tanks. So we had 1,000 gallons of fuel. You could literally fly five or six hours with that kind of fuel. And uh, so we, they went in low level and skip bombed in, in trail formation. Uh, I was not in, the, in, this, in this raid, these four ships. And they never hit one of them on four times. They tried to hit a ship. And four times the bombs skipped over the ship and blew up on the other side or just buried itself in the water on this side of the ship. So we weren't we weren't too um, too good, but one one crew was shot down, and they ditched a couple of hours uh, south of the island, and uh, we went out looking for them the next day and couldn't find them. We went out the next day and couldn't find them. So the colonel in charge of the group said, "Well, let's knock off the search. We don't need to. We've lost them." And our colonel, lieutenant colonel, asked the group commander. He said, it's "Our people." Can I go one more day? He says, yeah, go ahead. And we felt that they were a little further back than where we were looking. So we went and searched a different area and found them the next day and uh, identified them. A Navy ship, the USS Witter, came in and picked them up. Uh, <laughs> they had three one-man life rafts. They, your plane has a five-man life raft that if when it ditches, when it gets underwater, the the canopy opens it automatically, but it didn't. So they didn't have a five-man raft. They only had the, the, the little dinghies that you get that's hanging on you. 
So they put the, the, the Kleckner, the co-pilot, was pretty badly wounded. So they put him in the in the uh, in one of these one-man rafts, and then Wall and, and uh, I lost his name shared another and Hemingway, the junior guy, 19 years old. They put him. They said, "You just hang on to the side. You got a life jacket on. You're not going to sink." And if sharks came around, they'd take Hemingway. They'd, they'd drag him up onto the one where two guys were sitting. And uh, okay, a ship, the tiger, they're gone. Back in the water, Hemingway. <laughs> At least they, they we identified him. They uh, picked him up by the, the winter, got him, took him to uh, back to Amaru, and we went. Wall joined my crew later. Uh, they uh, had some a sideline to tell them that. Uh, I thought I can't think of it right now. Oh, I know. Uh, I was reading and I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, in 1995, and I saw an ad in a magazine. Does anybody know Hemingway, Wall, blah blah blah? And I said, "Yeah, it was Kleckner." I said, "I called the guy in Seattle." I said, "That's the crew that just went down and raid on Palawan." He said, well, "I was on the ship that got him, and we were having a reunion, and we want to find him if we can and invite him to our to our reunion." So I was able to get him in touch, and all four of the guys went to the reunion with the with the Navy. And uh, they, every year they would join up and, and with guys that saved their lives. Turned out the biggest thing the ship did in the war was save four Marines. And so it was kind of a I love you too. It was a good sidelight. Absolutely. Ms. General Bartlett, let's pause right there. We'll sure. take a quick break. We'll be right back with retired U.S. Marine Corps Brigadier General George Bartlett on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. Honored to be joined in studio today by retired U.S. Marine Corps Brigadier General George Bartlett, a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And, uh, sir, you mentioned uh, the dramatic rescue of those uh, men who'd been shot down. On your bombing missions, how would you describe the level of Japanese resistance? How fierce was it? Very, very slight, to be honest with you. Uh, it was almost a cakewalk. Uh, it kind of made us all mad because we joined the to fight the Japs, not not just bomb them. And uh, we got to fly missions. After 25 missions, they'd send us to Sydney, Australia for R&R. &R. Now, the, in, the, in the war, World War II, Australia was a nation of uh, four million people. The Brits took a million men and shipped them to England to fight for the Brits in Europe for England, leaving the women and children alone in Australia. So there was a million women without husbands down there whose husbands were fighting for the Brits. So they'd send us to Sydney on R&R. &R. It was a dirty, rotten job to have to go down there and dance with those women and take them out and take them to dinner. And, and uh, the Aussies are great people, in case you don't know it. If you ever have a chance to go to Australia, do it, because they're, they're as much Americans as we are. They are really great. Fantastic. So after the war, you went to college. Got your degree, and then you were back in the Marine Corps at the start of the Korean War, but this time as an officer. That's right. I uh, got out of, out of the Marine Corps. I'd gone to Oregon State one term in 1942 and then got, got drafted and or enlisted, really. But I came back and went to Case School of Applied Science in Cleveland. It's an engineering school. And uh, played football. And, Flunked out after the first first semester, so I transferred to back to Oregon, and went to Eugene, uh, Oregon instead of Corvallis, because Corvallis was a Cal college. It really was a Cal college. They still say that. Yeah. Eugene, don't they? <laughs> and, uh, and so I went to. You took architecture in, at Oregon, and uh, I was in the reserves, and uh, then I got a disability, so I didn't have to go to the reserves anymore. And I uh, had, had fungus in my fingernails, it was really a bad disability. But um, it was enough to get, I, anyway, I got called back in 50. And six days from the day I left Eugene, Oregon, I was navigating a plane across the Pacific from El Toro, California to uh, Hawaii and then on out to Kwajalein and Guam, Tokyo, Korea, Tokyo, Midway, 
back to Barber's Point in Hawaii. And usually when we came back from Tokyo, they would put 26 litter patients on the plane and, and a nurse. And when they, we'd land at Hickam, and they would take them and put them in Tripler General Hospital in Hawaii. And we would pick up and go over to Barber's Point uh, an airfield nearby, nearby Honolulu and spend the night. And then we'd fly back to El Toro the next day. And then a week later, we would do the same trip again. And may, basically, we were carrying uh, the highest priority cargo was corpsmen because there were so many being shot and, and wounded in, during the Korean War that uh, the Marines needed corpsmen. And so uh, the Navy, the highest priority of cargo was corpsmen. And we had a, a GI can on the plane that we used as a, as a head, a latrine. And uh, the first, the uh, crew chief would say, okay, we brief you guys on leaving on this flight. Now, with blah, 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 the, the toilet. And he who first to use the can will leave the plane with can in hand. So everybody sat around for hours holding it till the, somebody uh, you know, had, they had the guts to get up and go to the toilet. And then they all, then the, the, that guy had to, when he left the plane, had to take the can with him. And, uh, <laughs> I guess I flew uh, 70 hours round trip from El Toro to to Haneda, Japan, and then Ryukuska, and back to uh, El Toro. I did that five or six for five or six months, and then was selected to go to an officer training course at Quantico. They brought 500 Marines to uh, Quantico on a screening course, and we had a 12-week screening course. And they commissioned 370 or 380 of them. And uh, luckily, I was one of the ones that got commissioned. We uh, then went on to uh, our specialties. I put in for flight school, thinking I'm a cinch now. But they said, well, not because I'm an officer and uh, I should be a pilot. I got 2,000 hours in the air, 75 missions. I'm a hero, blah, blah, blah. They wouldn't wouldn't hear me, and they said, "No, you're going to be an air controller." So they sent me to Cherry Point, North Carolina, for 12 weeks of air control school, learning how to be an air controller, and and uh, then I went to Korea as an air controller. While in Korea, we in the Air Force, the Marines in the Air Force, took an island in North Korea yeah, called Chodo. It's five miles off the beach, and it was up near Pyongyang. And we put a radar on it and a height finding gear, and the Marine Corps furnished the height finding gear. So they gave us two officer billets. So I was one of the officers that went up there with the first one that went. And it was really, it was all the whole air war for the Korean War was done right there in, in Chodo. And the B-29s checked in with us, the B-24s. Uh, that all the night fighters checked in with us. We ran uh, missions and flights to shoot down the, the uh, North Koreans, the Russians, really. And uh, so it was a really first class uh, operation. Uh, to get there, I had to leave my unit, fly up to Seoul, and then they drove me or put me in a helicopter and sent me out to Pyangdo, it's called the last island below the DMZ on the west. And we had a Marine unit out there and I checked in. And so then he called for the helicopter to come get me. And this helicopter left Chodo and was, was a hundred and some miles over water. And at that time, the ocean was frozen solid. And pilots and the, and the people in the plane were wearing what we call poopy suits, uh, immersion suits. And then I, didn't, I didn't have one, so they said, well, well, the chance of you living long after you go in, it's slim, slim to none anyway, so you get in the plane, we'll fly you up there. So they flew me up to Chodo, and I was, that's where I was, and it was, it was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We the first one of, during, the, during our crew, we had a four-man crew, and we had three radar scopes, and then the position called senior controller. So the four of us took turns doing one, a job at each one of those positions for eight hours. You might be on the night fighters, night bombers, uh, Navy, the Navy and Marine Corps scope, or you just could senior controller. 
Well, so one night, uh, the guy pilot says, uh, hey, my engine's acting up. Can I drop my bombs and give me a free free drop? And the guy says, you're right, you're over North Korea. Go ahead and drop and then go on back. Well, within an hour, the phone rang, and it was the colonel in charge of air control in the Far East. He said, who authorized that drop on on uh, North Korea? And the guy said, I did. He says, well, you dropped on the 1st Marine Division. And Marines don't like having Air Force guys drop bombs on them. So uh, you get down to the, to the beach tomorrow morning, and I'll send a plane up to get you. And I want to talk to you. So he, the colonel's plane was waiting for him. We got off a watch. This Air Force officer gets on the colonel's plane, and they fly off to Seoul. And uh, unbeknownst to, to them, there was a storm brewing. And after they left, we got hit with a hell of a storm. And they couldn't, he couldn't get back. So now there's only three of us to, to, can, to run four scopes. And the colonel just chewed his ass out. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And uh, the phone rings, and it's the general, General Barkas from the 5th Air Force in, in Seoul. He says, uh, who, uh, who controlled the flight that, uh, that uh, sank those, because th later on in the, in the evening, uh, there was a, a ship trying to get down, or some planes trying to get down to bomb Incheon, and we tried to shoot him down and couldn't, and they bombed, and we're going back, and we still tried to shoot him down, and we did shoot him down, but it was the same guy that dropped the bomb that controlled the intercept. So... General says, uh, who, who, who ran the intercept uh, to uh, get those planes? And he said, well, I got him right here. He said, Bring him over. And so the guy gets a bronze star for dropping a bomb on Marines and shooting down three Russian planes. Not a bad deal, you know. Not a bad deal. Let's take another break there, General sure. Bartlett. We'll be right back on sure. Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, along with retired U.S. Marine Corps Brigadier General George Bartlett. And... He's a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. We are just talking about his service in Korea. And, sir, go ahead and uh, pick up the story. I know there's an interesting story about a clock you wanted to share. Well, there's a plane was uh, shot up and uh, called us in the control tower, the control center, to uh, alert the uh, helicopters to come pick him up. He was going to ditch in the ocean. I said, why ditch? The tide's out. we got a 30-foot tide. Just land your plane on the beach, wheels up. He says, I said, no problem, do it. And so they directed him to the spot where he could start landing. He scoped it out and landed wheels up. So when I got off watch the next morning, the plane is sitting, tide's coming in. Well, I'd been a mechanic, so we got the wrecker, we picked it up, pumped the gear down, pumped the landing, the gear, the tail wheel down, and started dragging the thing up, the, up the, to the high water line. Well, the plane wasn't landing, wasn't dragging too well because the tail wheel was probably a foot in diameter and was just digging into the sand and the, wasn't letting us pull. The truck didn't have enough power. So we turned around and pulled it by the tail and we raised the tail with a bar that we shoved through the, the plane and pulled it off the ground, raised it up, and then towed the plane to the high water mark. And while we're doing this, the pilot comes in who had, had done it when they, the helicopter came to get him and and he said, what are you doing in my plane? And we're trying to save it. But in the meantime, we were, we were beating up the propeller and had, had kind of broken the tail wheel. But it wasn't going to fly into place anyway. So uh, we were drugged to the high water mark, and the Marines came up from, from MAG-12 and uh, stripped it down of all the parts they needed. So they, I, while they were doing that, I'm inside. I took the clock out of that plane, and I had that clock. Uh, I was in 53 probably for the next... 20 years, and uh, maybe even longer. And I found out, who finally found out who the pilot was, tracked him down, and sent the clock to him. Uh, well, maybe I've got the story wrong. Maybe, no, I, I had the clock, and this wrote the story up for the uh, newsletter from the Aviation Association. And the woman who recognized the name was her husband, was the pilot. And we verified that, that he was the guy that should have the clock. So I gave the clock up and we sent it to her. So this would have been in, uh, in 85, 88, 90, someplace in there, 95. And uh, she got the clock out of a plane that her husband was shot down in. in uh, 
not quite what, sure what year it was. Probably f 53, maybe. Yeah, probably 53. So the clock was in my hands for 20 years, and then she got it. But it was, a, it was really great to have it in a seven-day clock. Uh, General, uh, I know there were some very interesting assignments that you had between Korea and Vietnam, including uh, a very quick construction of a flight strip in Taiwan. Explain yeah, what that, happened there. Well, they, they had an operation on, on Taiwan from the 1st Marine Division, and we, we were supporting it. I had the only engineer company in the Far East, uh, C Company, 7th Engineer Battalion, and uh, they were based at Camp Pendleton, but this company was sent to 3rd Division so they'd have some engineer support. And so uh, I was, they wanted to, be, I should back up. Um, a Marine at Quantico, an, an aviator, was developing a, a, a landing field that would be portable because uh, jets were coming in and Marston matting has holes in it, so it's not compatible with flying a jet. So he said, suppose we took that Marston mat welded a sheet of aluminum on the top and on the bottom and then had some way to screw them together, we could build an airfield, a solid airfield of aluminum, and they wouldn't have any, what they call FOD, uh, foreign, object, foreign object damage in the plane, and we can, we, we can do it. So I was given the job to, um, to land, build the airfield on Taiwan. It was the first time it was ever done. And they had the mat, they had made the mat had it in storage on Okinawa, and they put it aboard ship and brought it down and delivered it to me, and I, we worked out a deal to lay this mat, and we, it was a lot more than just laying it. We found out that the, the way they screwed it together was done by hand, but you needed an air wrench where you just <laughs> and it was, then the two were together, rather than a T-bar where you'd stand there for 10 minutes to tighten one nut. And I, I went to the colonel and who I was doing it for, and he says, I'm, we'll have them to you tomorrow. Next day on Okinawa, two, four or five air, air, air guns were delivered to me at, this, at, this, at the company. And uh, we were very well then, then we messed with the, with the mat and figured out how long it would take us to lay the airfield. If, well, if we had the T-bar, it would take about five days. If you didn't have the T-bar, it would take less than a, less than a day and a half. So he sent us, he sent us the, air, the air guns. And we then landed and built, started building it on an old Japanese runway at Hung Chang. And we just took a grater and grated off the, the rice paddy type of stuff on the top of the concrete. It was two inch or three inch concrete. Would not support a present day jet engine, jet plane, but supported uh, World War II type planes. And uh, so we then marked on the, on the ground by saying, by, Tell the, tell the Jesus, whatever engineers use, I can't think of the name of it, and make make a mark, and then 1133 feet, six and a half inches, another mark, 1133 feet, six inches, another mark. So we started laying in three different places. We'd lay a row, come back, lay a row, come back, lay a row, and when when we got together, we just kind of fell right into place. We welded a sheet of aluminum across the top of the of the of the juncture, so the tail hook or the plane was completely safe, and we finished that field in 37 hours, and landed planes on it in 48, and the planes we landed were the high-speed jets, an F4D from Douglas, uh, F F uh, A4, little A4 attack plane, and uh, the colonel flew in a an F8U of Corsair, and uh, not a Corsair, it's a jet version of a Corsair, high speed, really a great plane. And uh, so we landed that. And then we took it up, took the field up, bound it up again, and sent a, we made a motion picture of it. Took that motion picture to Congress, the Marine Corps did. Congress said, boy, this is great, and gave the Marine Corps two or three million dollars. So they went down to uh, Alabama or Georgia, and uh, there's a and a company down there, the foundry that makes aluminum, and they ordered three aluminum runways, 
and they got one, they put it at, at uh, 29 Palms, California, and they put the other two in storage. So we had a, a, a runway that we could work on in California. It was really quite a, quite a, uh, quite a feat. It really is. It really is. I know there's another um, memorable project you were on involving the atomic issue. When was that, uh, and well, what happened? Well, uh, I I was uh, second lieutenant, and uh, realized that I needed a master's degree, so I put in for a, for a postgraduate school at Monterey, and uh, they said, well, we have, can't send you. But if you want to want to get a, go to night school, we'll bring you here to headquarters, Marine Corps in Washington, and you can go to night school in the Pentagon. The GW has a program, so I did that, and I got my master's degree in personnel management. And uh, and when I left the headquarters, went to I was ordered to Fort Belvoir Engineer School for 16, 20 weeks, and then I went to Camp Pendleton, and I walked into Camp Pendleton, and uh, well, at first. Got my got my master's degree, and the guy told me he said you're the 150th officer ever in the Marine Corps to have an advanced degree. Education was not stressed in in the military until the, the early 50s, and we had colonels that had sixth grade educations, you know. But uh, now everybody's getting better. Now today everybody has a master's degree. If you don't have one, well you're gonna you're gonna die on the vine. So anyway, I got my master's and I checked into the first division at Camp Pendleton and they said, wow, you got a master's degree. We're gonna put you in the Atomic Exercise Brigade. I said, what's that? He said, well, it's a secret we can't tell you, but you're gonna enjoy it. Well, I, I joined them and we went to Desert Rock, Nevada and went through three atomic bomb blasts. And uh, it's pretty impressive. I, the first one we, <laughs> for, for Priscilla, and countdown goes three, two, one, and then there's supposed to be a flash. Nothing. Misfire, 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 misfire. Then on the loudspeaker, do not move, do not stand up, do not open your eyes. And that went on for about four hours until I could get somebody in a, up into the tower to disarm the bomb. And what had happened when it was in a 750-foot tower when they took the elevator away, it, it bounced back and crimped and cut the wires of, that were going to explode the bomb. So it never exploded. So this, this guy climbs up a 750-foot tower, had a ladder that circled, circled all the way up. He goes in, disarms the bomb, and then, and then one, once it's disarmed, we can leave. So they said, well, we bring all these Marines up. We had a thousand Marines up there going through the case and, and he said well keep me here another week we'll put him on Hood. Hood was an 80 KT where Priscilla had been a 30 or a 20 KT. It was the, it was the biggest bomb they exploded in, in Desert Rock, Nevada. It was, it was, it was Hood. So we were in the trench and, and uh, countdown goes and when we hit one, I mean the light you would not believe. It is something, and uh, then immediately, and that's that's the only time you can be heard is when the light and the radiation of the of the thing. But we're in a trench down deep, so there's none none reflected to you. And the winds go by, and then from the back wind, then we can stand up and look around. And there's the fireball, a thousand feet in diameter, going up a thousand miles an hour. It's pretty, it's really pretty impressive, and uh, you rear. Then you form up in, as a unit, and you, you've got an uh, operation you're putting on. So you're going to attack two up and one back, and you attack right through ground zero, and you got your monitors. And so if you find a hot spot, while well, you tape it off, and uh, this is what you'd be, what you'd do in combat if, if you were in an atomic bomb blast. And so it was, it was a lot of fun. I uh, learned a lot. None of us got ra any radiation to speak of, although I got uh, melanomas on my arms, so maybe there's something to it. That was that was 60 years ago, and uh, but it was it was a pretty pretty impressive. In 1965, you 
began your first tour in Vietnam. And during that assignment, or service in that assignment, you were awarded the Navy Commendation Medal with Combat V. Uh, explain what your, your group was on that first tour, what your objective was, and, and what led to that award. Well, the Navy uh, had a, a ship, of, uh, the Marines afloat, had three ships that were a unit, had a thousand Marines afloat, uh, and still to this day have them. And they're called ARGS, Amphibious Ready Group. And uh, we were sent down to, to uh, Vietnam, and they, they, never had, they never had a staff. They just had the people in the unit. Well, you can't kind of be in a unit and plan ahead. You need somebody to do all the planning for you. So I was picked up and sent down to to the Philippines to join the ship. Two of us went, and uh, we so we wrote wrote the order. Well, we had this unit available, and during the, the Vietnam War, we made 15 amphibious landings at different points along I Corps to support I Corps operations, and we would. We knew where they, we had the intelligence to know where the Jap, or the Japs, the VC were, and, and then we'd plan an operation to land, to destroy them, and pull back to the ship, and go and make another. So we made 15 amphibious landings in the in the year that I was out there. So we were pretty busy. And it was really a lot of fun, and they they still still have that the, the plans for that, and with if they were to do something. Tomorrow, it'd be what we wrote in 19, 1964, 65. Wow. Um, let's talk briefly about your second tour. That was, I believe, starting in 1970. What, what was well, your went, unit and objective then? I went back to 3MAF. I went to head, 3MAF headquarters, mm -hmm. and I was a uh, lieutenant colonel, so jobs are kind of scarce, but I found a job as, as uh, uh, I gotta think a minute exactly what I did. Uh, I was G1, assistant G1, uh, personnel man, man type, and then the, the G1 went home, so I became the G1, and then uh, then I got promoted to colonel, and it was a colonel's billet, so I got to keep it. But in the meantime, I'd gone to the G3 slot and done done planning also for for operations. Uh, a very interesting, interesting job. The, uh, the Marines were, uh, that we had there, we had the 1st Division and, and some uh, unit of the 5th Division. So we had, had plenty of people to, to fight. It was a matter of getting them around and getting them, to the, getting them to the fight. Not enough helicopters to carry them. So a lot of them were seaborne and, you know, and strictly on the coast. After um, after Korea, I was sent to NATO and was sent to Naples, Italy, where I was the head planner in the logistics section for uh, for NATO, and we had uh, operations in Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. And uh, when I got there, I worked with a guy, and he said, "You know," he said, "We." Uh, Built a field on Taiwan, on on, uh, on uh, uh, in Sicily. Built an airfield. And we built one on Crete, and uh, the Americans told us we would, they'd be flying such and such a plane. Well, now that we've got that plane and we've got the field, planes can't land because the, uh, the tire pressure is too high, and it breaks up the concrete. So we really need. Uh, Need something either you know, deeper concrete, more concrete, or uh, smaller planes. Well, I said, you know, if somebody should have done a program as to run a study and find out. So I wrote a, a report on employment in the Med, and the Admiral who in charge of it thought it was pretty well written. So he sent me off to Greece and Turkey work the people there to see what they could do about developing some plans that uh, took into effect the thought of, uh, of strengthened runways and while we then we had the map that we could use 
what spread the, the, the weight. And so again, the mat that we had developed in Taiwan and had been purchased could be used in emergencies to land and support the Marines in Greece or Turkey. And uh, we never did it, but we had it ready to go one time. The, uh, oh, I'm getting all confused here. Well, let's take a quick break, General, and we'll be right back with our last couple minutes here okay. on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to our final segment on Veterans Chronicles for this week. I'm Greg Columbus, honored to be joined here by retired U.S. Marine Corps Brigadier General George Bartlett, veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And sir, you've had so many different assignments during your 36 years in, in the Corps. There was uh, flight, there was engineering, there was atomic, we talked about that. A lot of them involved planning, though, especially as you increased in your rank. Um, as you learned about planning, did you discover that it's something that can be easily taught, or is a lot of it quite innate? Well, I don't think it can be taught, but it can be gleaned by having done it. And uh, the, the G3 or the S3 of the unit is the key guy, I think, in, in, in any operation. The, the three is where all happen, operations, it's where it all happens. And you need a planning staff that for future stuff, to keep, to be up to speed on on plans that you know what's capable, what you're capable of, and if you get a, a new new uh, a new ability or a new new something, to write that into the plan and use it on the next operation. So it's, it's something that has to happen, but the planner uh, is a key key guy as far as I'm concerned. He, the, the guy, the operations guy, is just doing daily stuff. But you got to have somebody looking ahead for you, with the guide of the future as to what might happen, and how we would, re how would we react, and and then get it organized so that you can react. You were promoted to brigadier general when? Uh, 1975, and uh, at headquarters Marine Corps and uh, was put in charge of uh, the PXs and the commissaries, um, housing, construction, uh, that's about it. All of, I, 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 thought my, I thought I'd been elected mayor of the Marine Corps because <laughs> I had all, of, all, the, all the stuff to do. Interesting job and in never a dull day, but there wasn't, um, I didn't see any, any, any uh, going to war as, as, a, as commissary and PX guy. But uh, it was an interesting job, a fun job. Somebody had to do it. So I went to the, went to the commandant and, uh, after two years and said, is there any chance of getting a, a command? Everybody wants, wants a command, that's the main thing. He said, well, boy, George, he said, uh, and I'm not sure, he said, when, when you made general, you were deep, they deep selected you. And as a result, uh, you, you really you know, are now a general, but you were deep selected. And uh, then you know, if I were, were to assign you someplace and you didn't cut the mustard, then I'd, I would put me fair to the troops. I said, Judge, you told me it was, uh, I wasn't passed over uh, or anything. You told me I had a chance. And now you're telling me you won't sign me one to a, to a command because it wouldn't be fair to the troops. I said, I don't think you're being honest with me, General, and uh, walked out and re retired. Put my letter in to retire, which, which really, excuse me the expression, pissed him off. But uh, I had 36 years, and if I wasn't going to get a command, I wasn't going to hang around. And uh, walked out, found a civilian job, enjoyed it. It was, it was really great with American Gas Association. And then I got a call from P.X. Kelly, the acting, I guess he was the assistant commandant, yeah, assistant commandant. He said, George, he said, uh, we're looking for a replacement for somebody to run the Marine Corps Association at Quantico, which published Gazette and other neck magazines and run, run the operation down there. Would you be interested? And I said, no, I left the Marine Corps. P.X. I, Told General Wilson, I 
had a great great 36 years, but now I'm on, on retired life. And he said, well, he says, um, we really need you, but you, would you come back and run the, run the association? So I returned to Quantico to run the Marine Corps Association, which I found out was going broke when I got there. So uh, we did a few things, and within, uh, within two years, I had amassed enough money that we could build a brand new building, pay cash for it, I think $3 million cash, and uh, have a new new building for, uh, on the base that if anything happened and we didn't use it, well, it would revert to the Marine Corps. But it was the Marine Corps Association. So I had a staff of, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 people, published two magazines, running a, running a bookstore, uh, running an antenna in, 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 in uh, the life, life insurance program. And we made um, <laughs> we made, we made a bundle of money. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's made it made so much that after I left in ten years, and it was it was taking care of us, and it was doing well for the Marine Corps. They they did well by us. Terrific, sir. Last question. Obviously, with a career that explored so many different things and served in three different major wars, what? What do you think of most when you think about your service? What are you most proud of? I kind of roll it all into one. Uh, proud of everything I did, and uh, but I think uh, my contribution in, on the runway, the aluminum runway, and uh, is was probably the most important thing. I, my contribution, was the Satch runway, short air field for tactical support. It had the biggest impact on what we did as a Corps. And uh, I enjoyed enjoyed being the guy that, that did it. I had a great crew, great crew of people who did the work and got it built and saw it the way I did. And uh, it was a lot of fun, all in all. And I don't think, I never looked, I never looked back. And when I retired, I developed a five-year plan things to do. Well, it turns out uh, my five-year plan of places to go and things to see, I ended up with two five-year plans. And the only place I haven't been in the world is the Antarctic. And so uh, I think I'm successful. But I would love to have gone down there. Well, you've finished most of the list, which is better than most people can probably say. Uh, General Bartlett, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate well, you're it. You're certainly welcome, and I thank you for taking the trouble to hear what I had to say. Most of it was true, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure it all is. Retired U.S. Marine Corps Brigadier General George Bartlett, veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I'm Greg Karubis. This is Veterans Chronicles.